Well, good morning, everybody. We've got some folks that uh, we haven't seen in a little while. Well, Gay only missed one week, but uh, we miss her when she's not here. So, Gay, we're glad you're back. Beth, good to have you up here. Front row looks complete now. <laughs> and Blondie, are you here between trips or something? No, I'm here, I hope. Good. Good to have you. Tom Bell? Yes, sir. Always good to have you with us. I need to mention that the new quarterlies are in for those of you that use them. They're back here on the table. And uh, don't forget the chili cook-off coming out. Actually, we've revised it slightly, so it's a chili slash soup cook-off. But uh, for those of you that are going to, uh, to attend or participate, Make your plans. It's March the 8th. We've got signs up there. Jim Burson has notified us that he's already collecting his roadkill. March, March 18th. <coughs> well, the, uh, the Bible conference, they've asked us to pack the pews tomorrow night, and I hope that we get nearly everybody that's in here, plus a few, there to pack the pews because we'd like to make a really good representation of our class. They'll have a featured section for us. I'm sure they'll recognize us, so let's just do our best to uh, support the class and enjoy the conference. <coughs> Loretta Cole has agreed to take the leadership role of the uh, last Sunday lunches she, I, I can't think of a better person to, to take that particular job on, so uh, she's, uh, she'll be uh, contacting the people and letting us know. Uh, she contacted them a little early. I'm going to let her know as soon as we leave class, I'll give her a call, that she had set something up for today, but it's the last Sunday of the month that we do that. Speaking about the l latter part of the month, gentlemen, Romeo's this coming Saturday, 8 o'clock at Bacon's. Let me see a show of hands of those you know you're going to be there. Joy wants to go. Okay. Okay. I expect you to be there now. Okay. Have I missed anything? Well, I've got a few more thoughts for our generation. You feel like it's the morning after and you haven't been anywhere. <laughs> Nearly everything hurts. And what doesn't, doesn't work. Your back goes out more often than you do. <clears throat> You've joined a health club, but you can't find time to get there. You need glasses to find your glasses. Your knees buckle, but your belt won't. Your children start to look middle-aged. You have plenty of room in your house, but not enough in the medicine cabinet. And finally, now that you have all the answers, nobody asks the questions. Jimmy, come tell us about Daniel. Well, from the preaching this morning, what an act to follow. Whoa. But we're going to have a good lesson in Daniel today because God gave me a special word to give to you today. So, but first of all, let's look at some, uh, here's church signs. Life is a maybe, death is for sure. Sin is the cause, Christ is the cure. Isn't that good? Sin knocks a hole in your bucket of joy. Here's a good one here. Big Bang Theory. God spoke and bang, it happened. <laughs> the wages of sin is death. Repent before payday. Here, here's, I'm going to show you this one. This is, this is proof that there are, there's people in the world that are not prejudiced about anything. And black bears are those people. Look at this. White, black, man, woman, gay, straight, 
Catholic, Muslim, American, Mexican, they all taste like chicken. (laughs) 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 Yeah. Either way. So that's the way it ought to be. No prejudice. Here's a little Maxine. Men don't have babies because God saw the way they handle a cold and knew the species would not survive. <laughs> and all the, all the ladies said, amen. Right? Here's one. This, see if you can figure this one out. The Hamlet Hotel. Food lodging. You got it? The Hamlet Maneuver is for food. <laughs> I knew y'all would catch it. I knew you'd catch it. Okay, here's my serious one for the day. Many can bring the scriptures to the mind, but the Lord alone can bring preparation, can prepare the mind. Let me do that again. Many can bring the scriptures to the, to the mind, but the Lord alone can prepare the mind to receive the scriptures. So that's our prayer today that we have the mind to receive the scriptures for today. Okay? Yeah. We, we've been in the book of Daniel for several weeks. We have two more today and one more week. And then we're going to go to First and Second Thessalonians. Now that ought to be an easy thing for us to do rather than do Daniel. Can you spell Thessalonians? Yeah. One T-H-E-S. <laughs> <laughs> and we saw in the introduction that the central theme of the book of Daniel is God's sovereignty over history, empires, and kings. There are no circumstances, situations, or crises outside of his rule. In other words, God is sovereign. We saw in the first six chapters, God can use people, places, and things to accomplish his purpose. He used Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to teach us about the integrity and the importance not to compromise the beliefs that God has placed in your heart. God used Nebuchadnezzar to demonstrate pride to humbleness. God used Daniel to soften the hearts of some wicked kings so that they would believe in the one true God. God used food, fiery furnaces, 90-foot statues, and hungry lions to provide examples of his mighty power. As we come to chapters 7 through 12, we're going to see that Daniel has a series of dreams and visions from God that allows him to look into the future to foresee the events of the end times. I've always been reluctant to attempt to teach on the apocalyptic revelations concerning the end times, mainly because of the controversy of all the symbolic language that is used to describe what will happen in the last days. If you study this very much, you're going to know that there's one person will think this symbol means this and one symbol means that, blah, blah, blah. And, and to tell you the truth, I'm not smart enough to go through here and teach the end time stuff. So, God gave, me, God gave me a perfect example of what to do when, when you're thinking about the end times. We're going to look at that in just a minute. I believe God has given me a truth to share with you today that will help you as it helped me to understand and possibly see God's plan in a different way. Let me show you what I discovered as I studied the last couple of weeks. Now, you know, we all have, the teachers and, 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 and uh, Harry, we all have lunch together on Wednesday. About three or four weeks ago when I found out that I'm going to be doing chapter 7 of, of uh, Daniel, I told them, I said, look guys, that, that's a freebie for me. I'm, I'm going to go find me another lesson to teach. So I started looking through the Bible. And I said, yeah, I found some pretty good stuff. But the more I st- tried to find something else to teach, the more God put me right back to Daniel again. And I read and I read and read. And Finally, about Monday or Tuesday of this week, he gave me he gave me a word, and allowed me to study all day Friday to, to plan this lesson. And you know what that was? Friday was the anniversary of the death of my sweet wife. Aww. So, the thing that kept me together was God's word. Amen. So that was really cool, right there. I mean. I, and my, my, the only thing that kept me reminding me of, 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 of the event was my daughter-in-law kept texting me every 15 minutes saying, are you okay? Are you okay? Or, <laughs> I, I said, I'm not going to be okay as long as you keep texting me about it. <laughs> anyway, I had some good time. I, I had, I, people took me to lunch three or four times this week to, just to keep, try to keep my memories down. So everything's worked. 
It's hard to believe the whole year has passed, but praise God, she's not suffering anymore. Anyway, here's what I discovered. In Daniel, everybody have a handout, right? Okay. In Daniel chapter 7, chapter, chapter seven verse 1. Re read, let me, let's read this together. Read, follow me. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of the Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions in his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the facts, telling the main facts. He, he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Other, other translations in King James says, Daniel told the sum of the matters. Okay, the sum of the matters. Well, that actually boils down to telling the main facts. First of all, we see, we see that Daniel wrote about these visions about 30 years before the amazing story of God's protection in the lion's den. In other words, he goes back to the first, first year of Belshazzar, which is about 30 years back. So he had these visions and all somewhere before, between chapters 4 and 5 of Daniel, in that area. Okay, So and, and we're not going to read the entire chapter 7, but I'm going to go through some various passages there and I suggest here's what I suggest you do that when we get through with this lesson you take this handout and you go and read chapter 7 on your own and I believe that God will the Holy Spirit will reveal some truth to you through it once you hear once you hear how you, how you read it with, with the Holy Spirit in mind okay now verses 2 through 8 I'm going to summarize some of these for you here's the here's the part here's the part here that it kind of made me nervous about trying to teach this and I'm going to summarize this but I'm going to show you how, I'm going to show you how, how God told me to, to teach this so verses 2 through 8 four different beasts appear in Daniel's vision coming up from the great sea the first beast is like a lion with eagle's wings standing on two feet has a man's heart the second beast is like a bear it was raised up on one side had three ribs in his mouth between its teeth the goal is arrive, arise, devour much flesh. The third beast is like a leopard, which on his back four wings, which on his back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. The fourth beast, now this is the most dreadful and terrible of them all, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. The, the beast has ten horns, and three were replaced by an eleventh horn, whose eyes were like the eyes of a man, and the mouth speaking pompous words toward God. This is most likely the Antichrist, whose, God, whose goal is to pers persecute the saints and devour the whole earth. Okay? Now, here's the deal. If we focus on these beasts that we see and the bad things they will do during the end times, we could become confused and fearful and full of worry, especially if we hear, start hearing people describe what, what each one of them means and so forth, okay? Now, this is in the Bible, so it's, gonna, it's real. It is real truth, okay? Uh, there's going to be some bad things that happen in the end times. But as we're going to see in here, I believe we're going to be watching this from the, from the throne of God, okay? And when I was studying this, I, I, I heard a, a, a sermon by a... Uh, uh, Anyway, as a Jewish person, Zechariah, Ray Zachariah, is that Ray Zechariah? I heard a sermon. He said that most, most uh, prophe prophecies you don't understand until they happen. And then he gave the example of all Jews knew the book of Isaiah heart to heart. They could, they could just about quote it heart to heart. But they didn't understand it until what? Until it became true. When Jesus came to live on this earth. And that's why you see so many Jews come to, come to know Jesus because they know, they know what, the, what Isaiah said about Jesus. And then when they actually see and saw what happened, Jesus actually came, they, they turned their life over to him. So that's, that's probably the same thing with all these, all these animals, all these beasts are going to come and devour the earth and wreak havoc on the earth. Well... I don't believe we'll actually understand all that until we actually, it actually happens. And when it happens, we're going to be up there with Jesus, as far as I'm concerned, okay? So anyway, let's go from there. I believe that God included all this graphic illustration in the Bible to show us that our future as Christians is safe with him. And the future of those that do not believe in the salvation 
that Jesus brings. In other words, if we are Christians, we can say, this is what's going to be happening back in, in those days. And the, and, the, and, and the non-believers are going to see that. And maybe, and maybe we'll be fearful enough of what's going to happen to say, I don't want to go through that. So it's, it's kind of a gospel. It could be a gospel type thing too to the unbelievers. You know, see what I mean? But for us, I think maybe if we have family that are not Christians and we don't want to see them go through all this, that maybe it would be a good time for us to start like, like the preacher said this morning, start sharing the gospel with people. We're going to talk about that in a minute too. Okay. Remember verse 1 when it says, The he, Daniel, wrote down the dream telling the main facts. The main facts. Well, we, we as teachers talk a little bit and everything. And Richard, Richard put something in my head that made me go back to look at this. Look at, let's look at the, what, are, what are the main facts. Let me look. I think we found, found the answer in Revelation 1.1. Look at this. The revelation of Jesus, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly happen and come to pass. And he sent and signified it by sending to an angel and to his servant John. The, we always look at the revelation, and we call it what? The revelation of what? John. No, it's the revelation of John. Well, this says that the book of Revelation is what? The revelation of Jesus. The revelation of Jesus. He gave it to John to write down. Okay, so do you do you realize the entire Bible is the revelation of Jesus? The entire Bible. You can find we've been we've been trying to prove this to you for years. That every verse in the Bible can relate somewhere to Jesus in there, and the, and the whole Bible is toward Jesus. So anyway, so what is the main fact of the book of, uh, in Revelation? What is the main fact in the book of Revelation? The revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, so now. Let's look at this chapter 7 a little bit differently. I believe Daniel is telling us the main facts are what? The revelation of Jesus Christ. Found in verses 9 through 14 and in, in his own interpretation. Now in this particular dream that Daniel has, he go in, 9, in 15 through 27, he interprets this dream himself. Just like he was doing for the kings of, of other places. So it's, it's very easy, easy to read. And let me tell you, when you read this, read it in like, like a, a new new. New Living Test translation or something. It's a lot easier to read. Or, or the message even. Something like that. But the King James and the New King James is a little bit hard to understand. Uh, difficult for the words. If you do it in a better... By the way, do y'all do y'all all know about the, the BibleGateway.com? Y'all know about that? There's a, there's a, just type BibleGateway.com and it comes up and there are 25 to 30 translations that you can go through. We use those as teachers. And uh, you can try... In other words... When, when we teach a lesson, we read that, transla that, story, that passage in about four or five translations, and, and God really speaks to you by using various translations, by putting the words that you can understand, rather than sometimes the words you can't understand. So let me, that's, just a, that's a freebie. Okay, in verses 9 through 10, let me show you what it's talking about. 9 through 10 talks about God's glory. We, for, now what we talk about first, all the animals and, and the mean dudes that are coming, including the Antichrist, and that, that, that's all coming. And in Revelation, it says that Jesus is telling John about that because these are things that are going to happen. But what's, what's, the, true, what's the true thing going to happen? The revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay? So look at God's look. In Daniel's vision, the thrones are put in the, their place, and the Ancient of Days, which is God the Father, appears in holiness and glory. And is ministered to by millions of saints, with even more millions of saints standing before him. As the court is seated, the books are open. Millions of saints. Millions of saints. Who are who do you think is included in these millions of saints in the future? Huh? Us? Are you saying us? How I many you think us? Yeah. There you go. We are going to be with Jesus. With God and Jesus beside the throne, watching all this happening. Okay, so that ought to bring some relief to you that you're not going to go through all this mess. Okay, now thirteen through fourteen. Well, wait a minute. Let me go back to that one more time. And he says, as the court is seated, the books are opened. Okay, the, and G, God is sitting on the throne. So, what event in the Bible do you think this is right here? God's sitting on the throne, and the books are opened. Would you think that's probably the great white throne judgment? That's what I would think. He's going to be judging all the people that don't believe in Jesus Christ, okay? Now, the books are open. 
What, what, what is the main book that we know of that's in Revelation? The book of life. And what does the book of life say? Um, what does God say about the book of life? He says, anyone whose name is not found in the book of life is cast into the sea. The, the fiery sea, the fiery sea, okay? So this is going to be the time when, when the, all, all the people that do not believe in Jesus Christ are going to come, come to a, a conclusion that they made the right choice, okay? Yeah. In 13 through 14, Jesus appointed king. I, Daniel, was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of God, one like the Son of Man, which was Jesus, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which, which will not be destroyed. Would you believe that this is the, one of the main facts in the book of Daniel? The, there's, there's a fact that there's going to be some, there are going to be some kings up, come up out of the ocean and all that kind of stuff and rule the, try to rule the world and all that kind of thing, but that's, that's, that's happening. But here's, here's what's really happening, is Jesus is appointed a king. Now, 16 through 18 is truth revealed. I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts which are four are four kings which are to rise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever and ever. Now it says... The great beasts, which are four, they're going to come up. You know, it says, but. They're all going to be here and do all that, but. The saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever. That's, that's us. That's us, right? Okay. That's a good idea. Now, I, uh, I, found some ex, ex, I found some commentaries that are outstanding. And... You're going to want to keep this handout because it's got some very good facts to it. It, it, from these, from these, it didn't come from me. I'm not smart enough to figure all this out. But these guys that are writing this had to do. The first one, the first one is the Ancients of, Jay, Ancients of Days by Chuck Swindoll. I'm going to read this and you follow, okay? Ancient of Days. The being on the throne who has all authority is God the Father. As Moses explained, the Lord himself is God in heaven above and on the earth and beneath. There is no other. The words ancient of days are a way of describing God as a, listen, listen to this. God is a firsthand spectator to the past, present, and future. The climax of Daniel 7 mentioned is a transfer of power between God and Jesus. Isn't that neat? I don't know if y'all seen Richard do this before on the, on the, on the, on the, on the three-foot stick. If, if we're looking at that, what are we looking at? We're looking at a little, little small area. God's, God, God can see the beginning and the end and in the middle. He's looking at all this. I like what he said about that. He, he's a first-hand spectator to all this. And it, weigh, it, it adds weight to the events unfolding in Daniel because God is giving authority to the Son of Man. God has given His Son the keys to the kingdom that never ends. All the scripture leads up to the moment when this earth will pass away and the new heaven and earth will be established. During this time, every person will be judged and Jesus and that will be judged. And Jesus is our rightful judge because he chose to be obedient to God to come to this earth and be our savior. It's important to keep in mind, this is this, God isn't retiring or stepping back, he is sharing his glory with his son. Isn't that good? I'm very dry this morning, excuse me. Now the next one on Matthew Henry, I'll tell you what, I, I like Matthew Henry, but I, when you read what he says, you can't hardly understand him most of the time because he uses such different words back in the old, the old days. But this one here I found, he speaks, 
God gave him the ability to speak common English in this particular one. And let me, let, let, follow me as long as we read this. Matthew Henry, verses 7, chapter 7, 9 through 14. These verses are for comfort and support to the people of God in reference to the persecutions that would come upon them. Many New Testament predictions of the judgments come have, have plain illusion to this vision, especially in Revelation. The Messiah here is called the Son of Man. He was made in the likeness of sinful flesh and was found in the fashion of a man, but he is the Son of God. The great event foretold in this passage is Christ's glorious coming to destroy every anti-Christian power and to render his own kingdom uh, universal upon that. The great event told in this passage is what? The revelation of Jesus Christ. Now see, God gave me this and I didn't even have uh, uh, Matthew Henry yet so he and I are agreeing with each other, right? That always makes me feel good when I'm saying something or trying to teach something and it's, it's, and it's uh, also said by somebody that has more brains than I do. <laughs> anyway, but, but ere the solemn time arrives for manifesting the glory of God to all worlds in his dealings with his creatures, we may expect that the doom of each of us will be determined at the hour of our death. And before the end shall come, the Father will openly give to his incarnate Son, our mediator and judge, the inheritance of the nations of his willing subjects, which is us. Right? Isn't that cool? Now, I personally, I personally believe because we Christians will be with Jesus during the end times horrors, we have no need to fear as we wait for the coming of Christ. We don't have a fear of all these end time things going to happen because we, we know we are protected by Jesus. And even if, you know, even if, even if, even if, if I'm wrong and God doesn't take us up, we have no fear because we're with Jesus anyway, right? Okay. What should now here? What, what should the church do while waiting upon the return of Jesus? Well, I got to looking around, and the number one passage that came up was was a Hebrews ten twenty three through twenty five. Let, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. That falls right in line with this. Now, verse 23. Verse 23. What did it say? It said, Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. You know what that says? The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. In other words, the main thing about the Bible is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So whatever happens in your life, we always ought to revert back to the main thing. Let the revelation of Jesus Christ come into your heart and it will, he, will, he will help you with fear, anxiety, all kinds of stuff. And I'll tell you what, this last week, this last week, I, I got with God so many times because Monday, Monday was uh, Valentine's Day. Uh, the, the next day, Tuesday, was Pat and I's 51st anniversary, and Friday was the passing of her, anniversary of her passing. So as I got with God, as I got, as I got to, in the Bible, started studying the Word, the revelation of Jesus Christ kept me in, in good, t good spirits and uh, kept, me from, kept me from crying so much all week, in other words. <laughs> okay? So praise, praise the Lord for that. Verse 24, it says, while we're, waiting, while we're waiting on Jesus to come, that we, the church, are to stir up love and good works in one another. Stir up love and good works in one another. I think we do that in this class. I think we really do that in this class. Stir up love and good works. Now, what do you think good works are? Good works are not something that you just do on your own. What do you think good works are? I think maybe we're talking about everybody being encouraged to use their spiritual gift. 
That's, that's one of the good works, right? We taught, we taught and revealed all the spiritual gifts not too long ago, and everyone in this room has a spiritual gift, and it says, stir up love and good works in one another. So we ought to stir up. I like another verse is spur on. It's spur on, you know. Stir up the love with one another and encourage one another to use your gift, okay? Use that gift. And if not, you know what? Most of you are using your gift and you don't even know it because it comes so natural, okay? That's how you can find out what it is. Okay, verse 25. Encourage one another to attend church services together because some need the encouragement due to neglect or fear. We have seen fear lead to neglect in the, in the past year. So what, I'm, what this is telling us is, you know, if there are some, some people not coming to church, by the way, we need each other. And that's what church is. We are the church. We, we, this building is not the church. We are the church. The church doesn't become the church. This building doesn't become the church until we get it. And the ones that we all need each other. The ones that are not coming because maybe they're afraid, uh, maybe they <laughs> maybe they got used to watching church with their underwear on and <laughs> a cup of coffee, you know. Maybe they got used to it. I mean, that's that's happening. That is happening. I promise you, it's happening. Maybe we ought to spur one another on. It's to be, come back to church. Come back to church. Now I know I realize there are some that are homebound and cannot come to church. That's why we're doing this. That's why we're doing this. In, in, on video so they can see that and they can watch it on video. But there are some that need to come back, in other words. What I'm saying say. Okay. Now, John 15, 12 is Jesus speaking. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No, there are at least 100 verses in the New Testament that encourage us to love and serve and help one another. And most of them end with, as I have done for you, says Jesus. Okay? Now, Max Cato, here's a good one. Max Cato, if I can find it. When God is praised, Max Cato, follow along with me. The devil is a splitter, a divider, a wedge driver. He divided Adam and Eve from God in the garden. He would like to separate you from God as well. He wants to take all unbelievers to hell and make life hell for believers. <laughs> Our weapons, listen to this part right here. Our weapons are prayer and worship and scripture. When we pray together, we engage the power of God against the devil. When we worship together, we do what Satan himself did not do. We place God on the throne. And when we pick up the sword of scripture together, we proclaim truth. Listen to me. According to Colossians 2.15, having disarmed the powers and authorities, Jesus made a public spectacle of the forces of evil, triumphing over them by the cross. Satan will not linger long where God is praised and prayers are offered and the word is lifted open. Satan will be vicious, but he will not be victorious. God is already won. Isn't that good? Max Licato is one of my favorite writers. As long, it says up here at the top, he starts with the devil is a splitter, a, a divider. The devil is in charge. He hates the church because it, it brings people to God. So he, he, he wants to bring division in the church. That's his main goal is to bring division to church. Now it says here, if we are praying and we are worshiping and we're studying scripture, that, that uh Satan cannot stand that, and it will drive. In other words, in other words, uh, what's the verse that says uh, uh, about Satan? I can't remember it offhand. He will, he will flee from you. What's it, what's it say? Resist the devil. He will flee. There you go. There you. I finally got it. <laughs> if if we as the church are participating in worship. And we are participating in uh, the scripture and prayer. We are resisting Satan and he will not come in and split the church. Period. Right? God is not a God of division. Okay? All right. What should I do personally as I wait on my Lord to return? Well, 
Look at Luke 10, 27. You shall, love the God, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. I mean, this, this is what Jesus said. I'm, I'm going to condense the Ten Commandments into two. And this is it right here. Love God and love your neighbor. Okay? Now, Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. In other words, those with a special relationship with God need not worry about provision or needs now or in the future, but seek to please God first by seeking as a priority his kingdom and his righteousness. Okay? Now, these are things we're to be doing while we're waiting on the coming of Christ. Okay? Good. Luke 21, 5 through 26 gives us encouragement while we're waiting on Jesus to return. First of all, it says, look up. When these things begin to take place, Look up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Jesus predicted that certain things would happen when the end time, when the end time is coming. Wars, earthquakes, famines, pestilence coming closer and closer together, each one intensifying. Christ also predicted that many false teachers would be coming in his name. Do we see all this happening today? Yeah. So what, what, is, what is God's word to us when all this stuff is happening in the world? What's his word to us right here? Look up. Look up. Look up. We know it's going to happen. We, so while we're in it, while we're in it, the only way to do it is look up and let him take care of it. The, rev, the revelation of Jesus Christ in your life. You know, I was thinking a couple of years ago, I, I read this particular verse and I thought, pestilence? We don't have any pestilence around here, do we? Well, what have we had for the last year, two and a half years? We've had pestilence, haven't we? And pestilence, we should, we should be, during this COVID breakout, we should be looking up. In other words, that's why he said, look up. Don't look at it, look up. I'm preaching to me also, okay? <laughs> the point Christ is making here in the text is when quakes and war and fear and famine and pollution are all around you, don't look to all these evils and sink into despair. Look up. Look at Jesus and be sustained. Your redemption draws near. Jesus is coming. Have hope. Okay. Next, next thing it says is shape up. But take heed to yourselves. Lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life. And that day come upon you suddenly like a snare. For it will come upon you all who dwell upon the face of this whole earth. But watch at all times praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Stand up. Shape up. Predicting, predicting the stormy world ahead, the Lord calls you to a faithfulness. Don't, be, don't let his return surprise you. Get ready. Be strong. This is the urging of Christ upon him. Stand up. Speak up. What should you do until the second coming of Christ? Look up, shape up, and now Christ said we well, should speak up. This will be a time for you to bear wit testimony in Luke 12. This, this will be a time for you to bear testimony. That's what we heard from the pulpit this morning. While we're waiting on Jesus Christ to come, we know it's going to happen. God's already told us there's going to be some bad stuff happening. Bad stuff. There's going to be some bad people and he's describing it, and these wild animals are going to come roaring through, roaring through the world, uh, devouring everything in their sight. So we know those who are left on this earth, after we are taken away, are going to go through some pretty bad stuff, right? So what, what should we do? We should pray for the people that we love, especially the ones we love, and our friends and our family, everybody we can. Pray for the world that you know, your world that you're in, that uh, they will come to know Jesus before all this happens. Because we we're going to be looking down on that. Don't you know it's going to be a sad thing to look down? I know there's no sadness in heaven. But when you look down and you see some of your friends going through all this, it's not going to be pleasing, that's for sure. Right? Okay. Okay. In other words, you should always be expectantly optimistic, looking up for Christ's return. You should shape up by putting your faith in Christ and by getting into good spiritual shape as individuals in the church. Then you can speak up. Telling the gospel of good news to your world. I'm not adding to scripture here. I'm not adding to scripture here, but I am adding another thought. 
while waiting on the return of Jesus, okay? And here it is. This, comes, this thought comes from the incredible mind of Max Licato, and it's called Hold On. Now, this, this is going to bless you. Jesus said, a branch, y- y'all got wiggle with me? It's on the last page. Uh, yeah, last page. Jesus said, a branch cannot bear fruit if it's severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. That's found in John 15. The dominant duty of the branch is to cling to the vine. The dominant duty of the disciple is the same. We Christians tend to miss. This, we banner about pledges to make a difference for Christ, yet our goal is not to bear fruit. Our goal is to stay attached. When a father leads, listen to this, when a father leads his four-year-old son down a crowded street, he takes him by the hand and gives him one responsibility. Hold on to my hand. God does the same with us. Your goal is not to know every detail of the future. Your goal is to hold on to the hand of the one who does and never, 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 ever will let you go. Isn't that good? These, these, are some, these are some nuggets. And you you can keep this hand out so you'll have all that. Top of page six. That's why he's got the reading. Okay. In the New Testament's 260 chapters, Christ's return is mentioned no less than 318 times. Some personal questions that I've thought of. First of all, are you ready for his return? Are you ready? Here's the main, here's the main question. Do you know Jesus? If you don't know Jesus, this would be a very good time to so come and talk to one of us about that. If you do, do you desire to become more like Jesus every day? Are you looking forward to seeing loved ones that are waiting for you in glory? Oh, amen, amen. How many, how many of you have lots of loved ones you're going to go see? They're waiting for you. Now, let me tell you what. <laughs> when I had COVID, back in September, I didn't feel bad at all. I just had a oxygen problem. And, uh, and, one, and one night I was, I was trying to take my oxygen off and I, and I took it off and I was laying there and I noticed my breathing was getting real slow I mean really really slow and I thought to myself you know I believe if I, I, believe if I just lay here I'll probably go I just feel like I could, I mean, my breathing is so slow and it brought to my mind and you know while I was doing that the vision of Pat came to my mind and she said I'm waiting on you isn't that amazing? I put my oxygen back on though. I didn't know. <laughs> it wasn't, I didn't want to go see her. I just, it wasn't ready yet. It wasn't my time. Anyway, that's amazing. That's amazing if things like that happen. Anyway, I am ready to go. I am ready to go when, when it's God's timing in my life. Bottom line summary of Daniel 7. All the kingdoms of this world will come to an end and will be replaced by the Lord's kingdom, which will never pass away. And that is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The book of Daniel gives us lessons regarding the sovereignty of God that we may need to believe and rest in. And I am sure glad. I mean, I learned so much from studying this passage. And I hope that, I hope that when you... Take your hand out and you go read this passage that God will speak to you. The reason I didn't go through this whole passage is I want you to read it and have this hand out and read some of these nuggets in here and let God speak to you. And I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will reveal so much truth to you that we won't be afraid of passages like Daniel 7 again. You know, I was scared to death to try to teach this lesson until God beat my heart. That that's not what it's all about. All the beasts and the mean people and all that kind of stuff. No, it's, all about. it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Period. That's all it is. That's not all it is. That's, that's what it is. Okay. Anyway, let me let me end with something from a. Oh, let me ask you a question. What is the main theme of the Bible? What is the main theme of the Bible? We just got through saying it. Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ. That is the main theme of the Bible. Let me close with a Charles Spurgeon. To win a soul is more glorious achievement than to be crowned in the arena of theological controversy. You understand that? We, get, we start reading some of these end time things and we get into a theological tra- controversy. And that's not what the point is. The point is to show here's what's going to happen. But if you have Jesus, you don't have to worry about it. 
Right? You have no worries after the revelation of Jesus Christ in your heart. Okay? Okay. Thank you for listening to all that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of your word. I pray your Holy Spirit was, uh, was moving through this room today to reveal truth and uh, from your word. Thank you, Lord, for giving us passages like this. And thank you for giving us the answers to these passages like this. Instead of having fear or ignorance or, or afraid of what, this, what it's saying. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who is the revelation of every, everything in our life. Let me pray. Amen, amen. Amen. Thank you. Jimmy, I've got something I need to read to everyone okay. before we leave today. This is a note, that, and most of you probably have seen this, but if you haven't, I want to read it again. And for those of you that are watching on video, if you don't know this, you need to be aware of it. After much prayer and consideration, we have decided to affiliate with another church here in Southlake. We have loved our time with everyone at NRHBC and especially in the Jeremiah 2911 Bible Fellowship Group. But since we are in a new neighborhood, we have found many more opportunities for ministry closer to home. We live in the midst of a mission field as our neighbors come from all over the United States and many of them are unchurched. They're very receptive to worship opportunities here in Southlake. We would love to come back to fellowship with you from time to time and hope we can continue the friendships we have made with uh, NRHBC. We pray for the continuing ministry in North Richland Hills. We love you. We miss you. But we feel the Lord is leading us into new and kind of scary opportunities. Bob and Nada Horn. So we'll miss them. They came in and, and I really admired the fact that they just jumped into a leadership responsibility just as soon as they were aware that one was needed. Uh, which brings me to the second point is we need to prayerfully consider, all of us, uh, a replacement for the two of them. Because someone needs to be the, uh, the leader of, uh, the, or the coordinators of our care groups. So that's all I had to say. I don't want to keep you, but I wanted you to all know that uh, they'll be missed. But I'm, I'm happy for them because they're going to be doing exactly what the Lord's calling them to do. Thank you.